Chapter Twelve of Whither Thou Goest by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Twelve. Contreras embarked on his great mission. Elderly man as he was, the fire of his convictions kept him alert and youthful. He stayed a day in Madrid. From thence he traveled to Barcelona, and then he went on to Fonterrabia. In the same little café de Concha he met several members of his brotherhood, Zorilta, specially summoned, Alvedero, Andreas Moreno, Violet Hargrave, and Mademoiselle de Mont. He opened the proceedings in his sharp, autocratic way. "'You have already had a meeting about this particular coup which I planned in London.' The young Frenchwoman spoke eagerly. If ever there was an enthusiast in the sacred cause, she was one." ready to be burned or hanged for her principles she had the spirit of the early christian martyrs we know all about it contreras in the spirit of true democracy they addressed each other by no formal prefix i have undertaken it it probably means death to me i can only escape by a miracle but it also means death to our enemies contreras looked at her approvingly from under his bushy eyebrows there spoke a true daughter of the revolution which is to remake the world if years had not come upon me if my eyesight were more keen my hand more sure i would not delegate this task to another less especially to a woman zorilta hastened to observe obsequiously we cannot afford to hazard your precious life contreras you are the head and brain of this organization the general directs the battle from safe ground he does not go into the firing line like the common soldier. Contreras smiled, well pleased. Like most great men, he was very susceptible to flattery, as easily susceptible as the most despotic monarch that ever ruled. I appreciate your devotion to the cause, your loyalty to myself, he said in his most gracious manner. When this great blow is struck, when we make a most terrible example, the echoes of it will reverberate through the world. The downtrodden population will arise, the world revolution will be in being. There was a subdued murmur of applause at the conclusion of his speech. Moreno applauded the loudest. Somehow Violet Hargrave could never force herself to be very enthusiastic. Moreno was watching her very narrowly. Mademoiselle de Mont spoke. I cannot say how proud I am to have had this task deputed to me. She looked very brave and resolute. The meeting lasted for over half an hour. Details of the great coup were settled. Contreras had a powerful and logical brain. He never allowed digressions or diversions. He always kept everybody to the point. When the meeting broke up, two people were very radiant. Contreras, who had planned the coup, the enthusiastic Valerie de Mont, who had undertaken to carry it into execution, with or without assistance, as might be determined. They strolled out from the obscure little café, one by one. Moreno presently overtook Mrs. Hargrave in her peasant dress. They lodged near each other. It was natural they should stroll along together in the direction of their respective homes. Behind them came Contreras, and the two other men who had joined forces after leaving the café. Contreras looked after the two young people with those keen eyes which age had not very greatly dimmed. "'The Englishwoman I know well,' he whispered to Alvedero. "'She is a protégé, almost an adopted daughter, of our staunch comrade Jacques. What about this Moreno? Is he to be trusted?' "'You know that Le Sue vouches for both.' "'Ah,' sighed Contreras. Lesue is a keen judge of men. I have never known him make a mistake, but I do not like the English mother. And in the case of Violet Hargrave, you have the English father, and yet you have no suspicion of her. Contreras nodded his massive head, the head with the broad, deep brow of the thinker. Your remark is just, my friend. I chose Violet Hargrave myself on the recommendation of my friend Jacques. That, of course, prejudices me in her favor. Moreno was chosen by Lesue. Perhaps I am a little bit jealous of Lesue, and I am growing old. No, cried Alvedero, with wholehearted admiration. Give you another ten years yet, 
and you will still be the brains and leading spirit of this organization. Zorilta is good, the sway has a touch of genius, but there is only one Contreras. Ten years hence you will be our leader as you are today. And while Contreras and Alvedero were exchanging these confidences, Moreno was talking to Violet Hargrave. We seem to be engaged in a pretty bloodthirsty business, don't you think, Mrs. Hargrave? Not much in common with Fleet Street or the flat in Mount Street, eh? Violet Hargrave smiled. We have both come out here to find adventure. Spain is a land of surprises. We shall have plenty of adventure before we have done with it. There was a grim note in the journalist's tones as he answered, On this particular coup, engineered by our great leader Contreras, it seems to me as likely as not that you and I shall meet our deaths. The one person who seems perfectly happy over the business is Mademoiselle de Mont. By the way, she went out the first. She must have flown along like the wind. The others are behind. I can see them through the back of my head. I can wager they are just discussing whether we can be trusted. You with your English father, I with my English mother. He shot at her a penetrating glance, but she did not move a muscle. The southern blood in both is stronger than the northern, she answered calmly, and we are each a true son and daughter of the revolution. He came to the conclusion that, for the moment, Violet Hargrave was impenetrable. Would he ever be able to disturb that sang froid? When he reached his humble lodgings, for it was a part of his role to live plainly, he found a long letter from his old friend, Maurice Farquhar. It was the letter that had been written from Ticehurst Park. It explained at great length that Isabel Clandon had lost her father, that there were no longer any ties to bind her to England, that she wanted to be near her lover in view of the danger that threatened him, above all that she did not wish Guy to know, at any rate for the present. Could Moreno help? The young man knitted his brows. His first impulse was to write back and strongly opposed the scheme. Then his subtle mind began to work, half unconsciously. Isabel Clandon over in Madrid could do no harm. He would not prophesy that she would do any good, but there was no knowing what might happen with this bloodthirsty brotherhood. She might be useful. He knew an English couple living in Madrid, old connections of his mother. He was sure they would willingly take in Isabel as a boarder. They were not rich people, only just in comfortable circumstances. They were elderly and childless. They would welcome a young girl as a member of their household. He would go to Madrid tomorrow and interview them, and he could kill two birds with one stone while he was there. He interviewed the elderly couple. They would be delighted to receive Miss Clandon. Afterwards, in response to a letter received at the embassy, Guy Rossett met the young journalist in the same obscure restaurant in Madrid where he had met him previously. "'Things are humming a bit, eh?' queried Moreno as they sat at a small table, quaffing a bottle of light wine. "'Looks like it,' answered Rossett, speaking with the usual English phlegm. "'I've had some very important information over today, most of which I expect has been supplied by me, not but what I admit there are two or three very good men out on the job. Moreno was dreadfully conceited, but he could be generous when he chose. He would sometimes allow that there were other people who might be, well, nearly as clever as himself. Well, Moreno, you wanted to see me. I take it you have a reason. Of course I have. I know you ultimately hear everything from headquarters, but that takes time and I am on the spot. I know all that, said Rossett. Besides, I have instructions from headquarters to keep in touch with you because you are on the spot. That is really awfully good of them when you come to think of it, said Moreno in his quiet, sarcastic way. Fancy them relaxing red tape to that extent. I fancy there is a new spirit abroad. Well, what is it? asked Rossett a little impatiently. Moreno puffed at his cigar a little time before he answered. I am going to put a very direct question to you. Some time ago you gave some very important information to the Secret Service about this anarchist movement. It is due to that that you are here. Yes, I did, answered Guy shortly. You know we are both practically in the same service, said Moreno slowly, 
and we might be frank with each other. Was that information given under the seal of secrecy? Guy nodded. Yes, it was, absolutely. As an honorable man, you could not reveal the name of your informant? I can give you my word it is very important. Guy thought for a few seconds. No, I cannot give you the name of my informant. It was done absolutely under the seal of secrecy. I understand, said Moreno, and a very considerable price was paid to the man or woman. I am convinced it was a woman who sold you this information. Quite right, but why do you say it was a woman? asked Guy Rossett quickly. If I had not already been sure it was a woman, my friend, I should be quite sure of it by your sudden question. You English people are not quite so subtle as we who have southern blood in our veins. Rossett bit his lip. He felt he had given himself away to this quick-witted foreigner, nine-tenths Spanish and one-tenth English. There was a long pause. Moreno shifted his point of attack. Do you know that Mrs. Hargrave is over in Spain in Fonterrabia? What? almost shouted Guy in his astonishment. Moreno looked at him steadily. Ah, you have not heard that from headquarters. Well, you see, they don't know the little side currents as well as I do. They do not know, for instance, that she is a sworn and apparently zealous member of the Brotherhood. Violet Hargrave, of all people, cried Rossett. He was in a state of bewilderment. You know, I dare say that Mrs. Hargrave is no friend of yours now, whatever she may have been once, said Moreno, speaking in his quiet, level tones. Yes, I think I can understand that. Come, Mr. Rossett, throw off a little of that insular reserve and let us talk together quite frankly. Believe me, I am speaking entirely in your own interest. There is no doubt that at one time you paid Mrs. Hargrave very marked attention that you fed her hopes very high. I was a bit of a fool, certainly, admitted Guy. And then, pardon me for speaking quite frankly, you threw her over rather abruptly because you had fallen in love with somebody else a woman, of course, a thousand times superior to the discarded one. You seem to know all about it, Mr. Moreno. It is my business to know things, replied the journalist quietly. Well, it is a case of the woman scorned, you know. I should say the fair Violet hated you now as much as she once loved you. It may be possible. I have a notion that you know women better than I do. The bad women, perhaps, said Moreno quietly. My experience has lain rather in that direction. I think I have only known three good women in my life, two of whom were my mother and a girl I was once engaged to. She died a week before our wedding day. Rossett regarded him with a sympathetic gaze. So this swarthy, black-browed young Spaniard had had his romance. His voice had broken as he spoke of his dead sweetheart. I am sorry for your experience. Most of the women I have known have been very good. The fingers on one hand would count the bad. But tell me more about Violet Hargrave. She hates me, you say? I should say with a very bitter and malignant hatred, was Moreno's answer. All arising, of course, from jealousy or disappointment. How far is this hatred going to lead her? I should say to the furthest point. Rossett recoiled. You mean to say she can have so changed that she would contemplate that? Moreno did not mince his words. You will take my word for it that it is revenge she seeks, and she will not hesitate. Her position in the Brotherhood will give her a very plausible excuse. For a moment Guy Rossett lost his head. Yes, you told me just now, I remember, she belonged to the Brotherhood. But I always understood. He paused. Moreno noted that sudden pause. Rossett had been on the point of saying something that would have revealed much. The young man leaned forward and whispered, Mr. Rossett, do you still refuse to give me the name of your informant? I am afraid I cannot, was the firm reply. My word was given, you understand. Again he seemed on the point of saying something further, and refrained. Moreno shrugged his shoulders. I admire your scrupulousness, but I still think you are very foolish in your own interests. Still, I know what you Englishmen are. If my suspicions had been confirmed by your positive evidence, my hands would have been very much strengthened. I could have dealt with the matter in a very positive and speedy way. 
Rossett kept silence. It was the safest method with this subtle young Spaniard, who took notice of every word and every glance, and rapidly constructed a theory out of the most slender facts. "'There is no more to be said so far as that is concerned,' said Moreno quietly. "'You could have made it very easy for me. As it is, I shall have to expend more time and trouble. But trust me, I shall get the information I want in good time. I shall find people in your own walk of life less scrupulous than you are yourself. Perhaps, replied Rossett briefly. I am keeping watch and ward over you, as you know, went on Moreno in lighter tones, and I promise you I will give you plenty of notice of danger. It is pretty near, eh? queried Rossett. Not very far off, I can assure you. I am seeing the chief of the Spanish police tomorrow. I have some very important information to give him. The next day Moreno had a long interview with the chief of police and also with the head of the Spanish Secret Service. Both the officials made copious notes at their respective interviews. When he left them Moreno felt he had done good work. He was sure that he could outwit Zorilta, Alvadero, even the great Contreras himself. He took a flying visit to England after this, having two objects in view. First, he wanted to see Isabel to arrange the details of her journey to Madrid. He lunched with her and Lady Mary at a quiet little restaurant in Soho. He promised to meet her on her arrival at Madrid and conduct her to her friends. He would say nothing to Guy Rossett till he had her permission. For at the eleventh hour Isabel's heart a little failed her. From what point of view would Guy contemplate this rather wild adventure? Would he take it as proof of her devoted love? or would he frown at the escapade as a little unwomanly? Men of the straightforward English type like Rossett are apt to be a little uncertain in their judgment of what is seemly in their womankind and what is the reverse. After luncheon he went to keep an appointment with one of the chiefs of the English Secret Service. This gentleman received him very graciously. Moreno stood high in his estimation. He had rendered very valuable service in the past and present, Delighted to see you, Mr. Moreno, but I should have thought at the moment you could hardly be spared from Spain, more especially the neighborhood of Fontero Villa and Madrid. I never take a holiday, sir, unless I feel I am justified. In this instance, I am. It is true I had a little private business on in England at this particular time, which does not concern your department, but I have sandwiched that in. The gray-haired gentleman listened politely. Moreno, as he knew by experience, did not make many mistakes. Some little time ago Mr. Guy Rossett, at present attached to Madrid, gave you some very important information about the anarchist movement in Spain. Ah, you know, do you? was the cautious answer. Of course I have known it for a long time. For very special reasons I want to know the name of the man or woman who gave that information to Rossett. I will give you my reasons presently. The other man thought for a moment. Yes, I remember the details perfectly. Rossett handed us certain memoranda which he had obtained from somebody whose name he would not disclose. That is exactly like Rossett. I have attacked him direct, and he still keeps silence. As an honorable Englishman he remains staunch to his promise. One cannot blame him, although in his own interest it would be better if he were a little less scrupulous. The gray-haired man began to get interested. Give me a few more details, Mr. Moreno, so that I can see what you are driving at. Moreno unfolded his suspicions briefly. He finished his story with the words, If you could not make Rossett speak, I cannot. But you have those memoranda in your archives. Will you show them to me so that I may see if I recognize the handwriting? The other thought for a moment before he replied, even in the Secret Service everything is conducted with the most scrupulous fairness, although their opponents are destitute of the elementary principles of dishonesty. Then he made up his mind. From what you have told me, I think it is wise that I should show you these memoranda with a view to strengthening your hand. Kindly wait a few minutes and I will fetch them. He was only away a very short time, but Moreno's nerves were on the rack during the brief absence. Were his suspicions going to be absolutely confirmed, or still left in the region of mere conjecture? The gray-haired man came back 
and placed half a dozen closely covered sheets before him. They were in a small, clear, feminine handwriting. Triumph glared in Moreno's eyes. As I guessed, she wasn't clever enough to disguise her hand. I can understand she could not run the risk of having them copied. Why didn't she get Rossett to write them out at her dictation? The other man made no reply to this ebullition on the part of the young Spaniard. Of course, you can't part with these or any page of them, asked Moreno. Out of the question, came the expected answer. I quite agree, but you can get photographs taken of them, and then I shall have this woman in the hollow of my hand. That shall be done, Mr. Moreno. You are going back to Spain today. They shall be sent to you tomorrow at whatever address you leave with me. And Moreno walked out of the cozy little room, well pleased with himself. Guy Rossett might have saved him all this trouble if he had chosen to open his mouth. Still, he had got the information he wanted. And above all, what a fool Violet Hargrave had been to let those memoranda go out in her own handwriting. Moreno, who thought of every detail, would not have done that. End of chapter 12. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.